Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about biosecurity as a cause area and how uh, the Open Philanthropy Project is thinking about it. Um, I think that um, this is a cause area that EAs have known about for a while but haven't dug into as deeply as some of the other things that have been talked about at this event like AI and farm animal welfare and global poverty. Um, but I think it's important and I think it's an area where EAs have a chance to make a huge difference, especially EAs with a slightly different set of skills and interests than some of the other cause areas. And so I would love to see more EAs engaging with this. Um, and when I say this, I want to make sure I'm clear, we're clear about the problem that we're talking about. Um, we're focusing on global, what we're calling global catastrophic biological risks at the Open Philanthropy Project. And um, I'm going to talk to you about how we see that risk and where we see that risk, where we think it might be coming from. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about how I think EAs can make a difference in it. And then um, I want to note that I'm not really focusing too much on the specific work that we've done and that others have done. I chose to do that because I thought it would be more interesting for people to just get a sense of what this area is like and the strategic landscape as we see it um, before getting into the details of specific organizations and people. Um, so hopefully that's helpful for everyone. And before I do that, I just want to note quickly that I think this is an area where there's a lot less thinking has been done for a much shorter period of time. And so to a greater extent, everything should be viewed as somewhat preliminary and uncertain, uh, and we might be changing our minds in the near future. Um, so the cause for concern here when we think about global catastrophic biological risks is something that could threaten the long-term flourishing of human civilization that could uh, impair our ability to have a really long, really big future full of joy and flourishing for many different sentient beings. Um, and so that's kind of different from what you might think about when you think about um, biological risks that most people talk about, which are often things like Ebola or Zika, which are unbelievably tragic for the people that are afflicted by them, but it doesn't seem like the evidence suggests that they have a realistic chance of causing uh, international civilizational collapse and threatening our long-term future. Um, and so to take this even a little bit further, we predict that we would need a really extremely big uh, biological catastrophe to do this. We're really thinking about something that kills or severely impairs a greater proportion of the entire human civilization than uh, happened in either of the world wars or in the 1918 flu pandemic. Uh, and that kind of implies y that we're thinking about fatalities uh, that could range into the hundreds of millions or even the billions. Um, and so there's a lot of really amazing work that could go into preventing smaller risks and that's not really what we've been focusing on so far and it's not what I anticipate us focusing on in the future. Uh, and overall, we're currently ranking this a high priority, although I think it's somewhat uncertain. I think it's high priority to figure out more, and then we might readjust our beliefs about how much we should prioritize it. Um, so what are these risks even like? Uh, we see the biggest risks are from biological agents that can be easily transmitted, that can um, be released in one area and spread, uh, as opposed to something like anthrax, which is, you know, very terrible in the space that it's released, but it's hard to imagine it really coming to afflict a large proportion of, human of humans and human civilization. Um, and then within the space of infectious diseases, we're thinking about whether the most, uh, most risky type of attack um, would be something that happened naturally in nature that just came out of um, an animal reservoir or something that was deliberately done by people with the intention of causing this kind of destruction or the kind of middle ground of something that might have been accidentally released from a laboratory where people were doing research. And our best guess right now is that deliberate things are the biggest risk accidental somewhere in the middle, and natural risk is low. And I want to explain why that is, because I think a lot of people would disagree with that. Um, some of the reasons I'm skeptical of natural risk are that, um, first of all, they've never really happened before. Humans have obviously never been uh, caused to go extinct by a natural risk. Otherwise, we would not be here talking. Um, it doesn't seem like human civilization has come 
close to the brink of collapse because of a natural risk, especially in the recent future. You can you know, argue about some things like the Black Death that certainly caused uh, very severe effects on civilization in certain areas in the farther in the past. Um, but this implies a fairly low base rate. We should think in any given decade, there's a relatively low chance of something just emerging that could have this impact. Um, and similarly, it seems like this rarely happens with non-human animals, that a pathogen emerges that causes them to go extinct. Um, and I know of, there's one confirmed case in mammals, I don't know of any others, and so that also implies that this isn't something that happens very frequently. And so uh, in any given decade, we should probably start with a prior that there's a low probability of it occurring. Um, and then finally, we're in a much better situation than we were in the past, and then animals are in some ways, because we have advanced biomedical capabilities. We can use these to create vaccines and therapeutics and address a lot of risks from different pathogens that we could face. Um, and then finally, on a kind of different vein, people have argued that there's some selection pressure against a naturally emerging highly virulent pathogen, because um, when pathogens are highly virulent, often their hosts die quickly and they try to rest before they die and they're not out in society spreading, um, spreading it the way you might spread the cold if you go to work when you have the cold. Um, now, before you like become totally convinced about that, I think that there's some good countervailing considerations to consider. Um, Humanity that make it more likely that a natural risk could occur now than it has in the past. For example, humanity is much more globalized, and so it might be the case that in the past there were things that were potentially deadly for human civilization, but humans were so isolated it didn't really spread, and it wasn't a huge deal. Now everything could spread um, pretty much around the globe. Civilization might be more fragile than it used to be. It, it's kind of hard to know, but it might be the case that we're very interdependent. We, we really depend on different parts to produce different goods, and perhaps a local collapse could have um, implications for the rest of the globe that we don't yet understand. Um, and then there's no, a, another argument one can easily bring up is if you're so worried about accidental or uh, engineered or deliberate attacks, there's also not very much evidence of those being a big deal, which I would agree with. There haven't been very many in recent times. There's not a strong precedent. Um, Nonetheless, our best guess right now is that natural risks are, are pretty unlikely to derail human civilization. Um, and then when we think in more detail about what, where these risks come from, we can consider the different actors. And I don't think that we've come to a really strong view on this. I just want to explain the different potential sources. Uh, and so different sources could be different states. For example, in bioweapons programs, they could develop um, pathogens as weapons um, that have the potential to be destructive. Small groups such as terrorists or other extremists might be interested in developing these sorts of capabilities. Um, individuals just on their own who have an interest, people working in various sorts of labs in academia and um, in um, the government and on their own. There's like DIY kind of uh, biohacker communities that do, that do different sorts of biological experimentation. Um, and so those are the different groups that might contribute to this risk. Um, there's different pathogens, and I think here our thinking is even more preliminary, but we're especially worried about viral pathogens because um, there's proven, uh, proven potential for high transmissibility and lethality among viruses. They can move really fast, they can spread really fast, uh, and we have fewer effective countermeasures against them. We don't have very good broad spectrum uh, antivirals that are efficacious, and that means that if we had a, a novel viral pathogen, it's not the case that we have a huge portfolio of tools that we could expect to be really helpful against it. Um, and then here I've just created a small chart that I think can help illustrate how we divide up these risks. On the top, there's a, a dichotomy of whether the um, whether the pathogen is more natural or more engineered, and then on the uh, vertical axis is whether it uh, emerged naturally or accidentally, or it was a deliberate release. And I, the reason I'm flagging this is because I think there's two different ways to increase the destructiveness of the attack. One is to engineer the pathogen really highly, and the other is to optimize the actual attack type. For example, if you released a pathogen at a major airport, you would expect it to spread more quickly than if you released it in a rural village. And so those are two different ways 
in which you can become more destructive if you're interested in doing that. Um, hopefully you're not. Uh, my current guess is that there's a lot more optimization space in, the, in engineering the actual pathogen than in the release type. There's a bigger range, um, but we're not super confident about that. Um, here's where the risk we see is coming from. Um, it, there's uh, advances in gene editing technology is a really major one. I think that they've created a lot more room to tinker with biology in general to both uh, m with lower resources and lower levels of knowledge and to a greater overall degree, um, create novel pathogens that are different from what exists in nature, that you can understand how they work. Um, and this has amazing potential to do a lot of good, but it also has potential to be misused. Um, it's becoming a lot cheaper to uh, synthesize DNA and RNA to get genetic material for different pathogens. Um, and this means that the, these capabilities are becoming more widely available just because they're cheaper. Um, it also means that regulating them and verifying, for example, the people that are purchasing them is becoming a bigger proportion of the costs, which means companies are d more and more incentivized to stop doing that. Um, and Biotech capabilities are becoming more available around the world. They're spreading to different areas, to new labs. And again, this is mostly a sign of progress. People are having access to technology. Places in um, Asia and around the world are, are becoming, um, having a large groups of very talented scientists, and that's, that's really great for the most part, but it means there's even more potential sources of risk than there were in the past. And then finally, all of those things are happening much faster than governments can possibly hope to keep up, and then norms can evolve. So that leads you to a situation where the, um, where the technology is outpaced, uh, our, our kind of society and our means of dealing with it, and that increases the danger. Um, and then I thought I would just like kind of contrast and compare biosecurity with AI alignment because I think it's something people are much more familiar with and I thought it might be helpful to draw attention to the differences um, for getting people up to speed. So I think that overall there's a smaller risk of a far future negative trajectory change from biosecurity. Overall it seems like a smaller risk to me. Um, and then there's less upside. So with an AI, you can imagine that if it develops really well, it has this amazing potential to increase human capabilities and cause human flourishing. With biosecurity, we're basically hoping that just nothing happens. Like the best outcome is just nothing. It's just no attacks occur, no one dies, things go on, society progresses, maybe someone develops an aligned AI. Um, but so it's, we're really about preventing downside risk. More of the risk here comes from people with actively bad intentions as opposed to um, people with good intentions or people who are just interested in the research, especially if you believe and you agree with me that deliberate attacks are the most likely source of concern. Um, and here, I think it's, it's much more the case that there's many relevant actors on both sides as, a few, as opposed to there being a few labs with a lot of uh, capabilities in AI. It could be the case that we end up with um, with the situation in biosecurity where there are millions of people that are capable of doing something that would be pretty destructive, and also we can unilaterally develop countermeasures against their attacks. And so there's kind of less connection between the sources of the risk and the sources of the risk reduction. They're more divorced from one another, and there's more possible actors on both sides. Um, and I think that the way that we're seeing this field right now is somewhat different from how most people are seeing it. Most of the discussion in the field of biosecurity is focused on much smaller risks than we're worried, the ones we're worried about. I think discussion of things with a greater than one million fatalities was kind of taboo up until very recently. Um, and it's been difficult for us to find people that are interested in working on that kind of thing. Uh, I think that part of the reason for that is it's been really hard to get funding in the space, and so people want to make sure their work seems really relevant. And since small attacks and small outbreaks are more common, a good way to make your work more relevant is to focus on those. Um, there's ongoing debate in the field about whether natural, deliberate, or accidental releases are the biggest risks. I don't think people are synced up on what it is. I don't think everyone agrees with us that deliberate is mostly the thing to worry about. And then people are really trying to walk this tightrope of regulating risky research while not regulating productive research, maintaining national competitiveness, and encouraging uh, productive biotech R&D.
So given all of that, we have some goals in this space. They're kind of early goals. I think they're things that after we can a lot more work to be done and um, they won't be sufficient on their own. They're mostly examples, but I think they would get us pretty far. The first thing is we just really need to understand these risks in particular. I'm keeping it very high level for now, both because there's not a lot of time, partly because I think it's that talking about some of these risks publicly is not a productive thing to do, and then also because we're pretty uncertain about them, and I think it would be really helpful to have some people just dig into the individual risks, think about what one would need to do in order to pull off a really catastrophic bioattack, how far out is that, what sorts of technological advancements would need to occur, what sorts of resources would one need to be able to access in order to do that, so that we have a sense of how big those risks are and how many actors we need to be worried about. And then that'll help us prioritize between them and prioritize things we can do to develop countermeasures. We want to support people and organizations that increase the field's ability to respond to global catastrophic biological risks. The reason for that is um, right now the field has kind of lacked funding for a long time. A lot of people have left the field. Young people are having a very difficult time going into the field. Hopefully that's changing, but it, uh, it's still a pretty dire situation in my, in my view. And uh, we want to make sure that the field ends up high quality with lots of researchers that care about the same risk we care about. Um, and so people that show signs of maybe moving in that direction, we're very enthusiastic about supporting them in general. Uh, and then finally, we want to develop medical countermeasures for the things that we're worried about. We've started having our science advisors look into this. We have some ideas about what the worst risks are. And if we could develop countermeasures in advance and stockpile those, I think we would be much better prepared to address risks when they come up. Finally, I want to talk to you a little bit about what I think EAs can do to help. Um, I see a lot of potential value in bringing parts of the EA perspective to the field. Right now, there aren't a lot of EAs in the field, and I think that the EA perspective is kind of special, and it has something special to offer people. Um, I think some of the really great things about it are, first of all, the familiarity with the idea of astronomical waste and the value of the far future. That seems like it's something that's somewhat hard to understand. It's a bit weird and counterintuitive and philosophical. A lot of EAs find it compelling. A lot of um, other people seem, find it wacky or just haven't really heard about it. Um, and I think bringing more of a concern about that pool of value and those people in the future who can't really speak for themselves to the, bio, to the field of biosecurity would do a lot of good. Another thing that I think is amazing about the EA perspective is comfort with explicit prioritization, the ability to say, we really need to do X, Y, and Z. A, B, and C are lower priority. They'll help us less. Let's, they're less tractable. They're more crowded. We should start with these other things. I think right now um, the field doesn't have a clear view about that. There's not a very, um, there's not a very well thought out and developed roadmap um, to addressing these concerns. I think EAs would be good at helping with that. Um, and finally, I think a lot of EAs have a skepticism with established methods and expertise, and that's great because uh, I think that's necessary actually in almost every field, um, and especially um, in fields that involve a, a complicated interplay of natural and social science. I think that there's a lot of room if, if for things to be um, skewed in certain directions. Uh, I haven't seen that happen too much yet, but I think that EAs that are looking out for that would be really helpful is in the field right now. There's some work going on at the Future of Humanity Institute that we're very excited about. Uh, and it seems like there's a lot of low-hanging fruit right now. There's a lot of projects that I think an EA could take on, and they'd be pretty likely to make progress. I think it's, there, it's more of a matter of thinking really carefully about something, pulling information together and analyzing it, and less uh, purely insight-based to reliably predict that you'll be able to make progress. And I think that's really great. I think that you should consider this if you are a kind of far future EA, if you find that those sorts of arguments compelling um, and you want to help preserve the value in the far future, make sure that we all get to have, uh, enjoy our amazing cosmic endowment. Um, and you think that you might be a good fit for this work. You like working in policy or in the biomedical sciences. Um, and especially if you're very comfortable not necessarily. Again, this is an area where I think that a lot of safety might come from 
people not overhyping certain sorts of possibilities as they emerge, at least until we develop countermeasures. And so it's important to have people that are um, feel comfortable and OK with the idea of doing a lot of work and then not sharing it very widely and actually not making it totally open, um, because that could actually be counterproductive and increase the risk. Um, so that's what I hope that people will be willing to do. Um, and I hope that we find some EAs who want to move into this field. If you feel like you're interested in moving into this field, I would encourage you to reach out to me or grab me some time at this conference and talk about both what you'd like to do and what might be stopping you from doing it. In the future, we might write more about how we think uh, people can get into this field and um, be able to do helpful research, um, but we haven't really done that yet. So uh, in the meantime, I really that uh, um, people reach out. Um, thank you so much, and I'll take your questions. Uh, OK, so we've got a number of questions that have come in, and I'm just going to try to rifle through them and, and give you a chance to uh, answer as many as we can. Yeah. So you emphasized the risk of viral pathogens. A mm -hmm. uh, couple of questions, ac actually, on this. What about um, the... I think, more well-known, if not well-understood problem of antibiotic resistance. Is that something that you're thinking about, and, and how big of a concern is that for you? Yeah, so I think that's a good question. Um, the Open Philanthropy Project has a report on, anti on uh, antibiotic resistance that I encourage you to read if you're curious about this topic. Um, I think it's a really big concern uh, for dealing with conventional bacterial pathogens. Our best guess is that it's not such a special concern for thinking about global catastrophic biological risks. Um, first of all, because there's already immense selection pressure on bacteria to, emer to uh, evolve some um, uh, resistance to antibiotics. And while this mostly has really negative implications, it has one positive implication, which is that if there's an easy way to do it, it's likely that um, it'll happen naturally first and not through a surprise uh, attack by a deliberate uh, uh, a deliberate bad actor. Um, and then another reason that we're worried about viruses to a greater extent than bacteria is just because of their higher transmissibility and the greater difficulty disinfecting things from viral pathogens than bacterial ones. And so I don't think that, um, that uh, antibiotic resistance will help with that that much. Um, but I think that we're, it's possible that we're completely wrong about this. I'm very open to that possibility. And I would, I'm, what I'm saying is pretty low confidence right now that, that that's not too great of a concern from the perspective of uh, far future biosecurity focus. Great. Next question. To what extent do small and large scale bio risks look the same? And to what extent do the countermeasures for those small and large scale risks kind of look the same? such that you can collaborate with people who have been kind of more in the traditional focus area of the smaller scale risks? That's an interesting question. I think it's a complicated one, and a simple answer won't answer it very well. I think that when I think about the large scale risks, they look pretty different from the most, for the most part from conventional risks, um, mostly because they are highly engineered. Um, they're optimized for destructiveness. They're not natural. They're not something we're from very familiar with. Um, and so that makes them uh, unlikely to be things that we have pre-prepared responses to. They're likely to be singularly able to overwhelm he healthcare systems, even in developed countries, uh, which is not something that we have as much experience with. Um, but the second part of the question about the degree to which efforts to address small-scale risks help with big-scale risks and vice versa, I think that that's somewhat of an open question for us. And as we w move towards prioritizing in the space, we'll have a better view. There's some actions that we can take. For example, advocacy to get the government to take biosecurity more seriously that I think would help equally with both. On the other hand, I think developing specific countermeasures, um, if we move forward with that, that will be more likely um, to only help with large-scale risks and be less useful with uh, small-scale risks, although there are counterexamples that I'm thinking of right now. So that's definitely not an accurate blanket statement. When you think about these sort of engineered attacks that could create the largest scale risk, it seems like one thing that has sort of 
been on the, the side of good, at least for now, is that it does take quite a bit of capital to, to spin up a lab and, and do this kind of bioengineering. But as you mentioned, stuff is becoming cheaper. It's becoming more widely available. How do you see that curve evolving over time? I mean, right now, how much capital do you think it takes to, to put a lab in place and start to do this kind of bad work if you wanted to? And, and how, do you, how does that look 5, 10, 20 years out? Yeah, uh, I think I don't think I want to say how much it takes right now um, or exactly what I think it will take in the future. Uh, I think it's the costs are falling pretty quickly. Um, it depends on what ends up being necessary. So, for example, the cost of DNA s synthesis is falling really rapidly. Um, and so it might be the case that you can um, you can that part is extremely cheap. But actually experimenting with a certain pathogen that you think might have destructive capability, uh, for example, testing it on animals, might remain very expensive. And it doesn't seem like the costs of that part of uh, a potential um, destructive attack are falling nearly as quickly. Um, so overall, I think it will continue to fall. But I would guess that the, the falling plateaus sometime in, in the next few decades. Interesting. Does biological enhancement fall within your project at all? Have you spent time considering, for example, enhancing humans or working on uh, gene editing on humans and how that might be either beneficial or potentially destabilizing in its own way? That's not something that we've really considered a part of our biosecurity program. Fair enough. How interested is Open Philanthropy Project in funding junior researchers in biosecurity or biodefense? And relatedly, would you say it's more valuable right now? Are you looking more for people who have kind of a high level strategic uh, capability or those who are more in the you know, weeds, as it were, of sort of wet synthetic biology? Yeah. Um, I think that right now we'd be excited about um, EAs that are interested in either, potentially, depending on you know, their goals in this field, the extent of the value alignment, um, and their dedication and, and, ta and particular talents. I think both are useful. I expect that um, the kind of specialization, for example, either in policy or in um, biomedical science will possibly be more helpful in the long term. I, I'm hoping that we'll gain a lot of ground on the strategic, high-level aspects of it in the next few years. Um, but right now, I think both are sorely needed. Next question. For someone whose education and skills have been focused on machine learning, mm -hmm. how readily can such a person contribute to the type of work that you're doing and, and what would that look like for them if they, if they wanted to get involved? I don't know. I've never seen anyone try. Um, I think that it would be possible because um, I think that there's a lot of possibility of someone who has you know, no special background in this area in general um, becoming really pr productive and helpful within a relatively short time scale. And I don't see machine learning background as putting anyone at a particular disadvantage, um, probably put you at a, somewhat of an advantage, although I'm not sure how. I think that, um, that right now, it would probably the best way to go would probably to just get um, a master's or PhD in a related field, uh, and then try to move into one of the relevant organizations, or try to directly work at one of the relevant organizations, like our biggest grantee, the Center for Health Security, um, biggest grantee in biosecurity. Uh, and for that, I think that probably having a background in machine learning would. Um, be neither a strong ne drawback or negative nor a huge benefit. That's about all the time that we have for now, unfortunately. But will you be at office hours uh, just after this? I don't have office hours planned, actually. But um, just feel free to grab me if you want to chat more. All right, awesome. Thanks, everyone. Claire Zabel, thank you very much.